there everyone and welcome back to Maho Mini, an infrequent series of videos about modern magical girls. Last time we talked about Magical Girls Sight, a series firmly within the dour 2010s trend of quote unquote dark magical girls. So this time, why don't we lighten things up by focusing on the other side of the modern magical girl landscape, the bright, frilly, hyper-marketable behemoth that is Pretty Cure. To anyone who watches this channel and doesn't know what Pretty Cure is, here's a brief rundown. In 2004, Toei Animation put out a series called Kutariwa Pretty Cure, or The Two of Us Are Pretty Cure. Its official title in North America is just Pretty Cure. The premise is about as bog standard as shows like this get. Two middle school girls, Nagisa and Honoka, discover a pair of fluffy creatures from another realm who task them with defeating the forces of evil. Nagisa becomes the magical heroine Cure Black, and Honoka becomes her counterpart Cure White. And, well, the two of them are Pretty Cure, or Pre-Cure for short. The original series lasted 49 episodes and was followed by a direct sequel series, Tariwa Pretty Cure Max Heart, plus two movies. Subsequent Pre-Cure series shifted to new casts of characters, each telling similar stories, but in alternate continuities. In the 2007 series, Yes Pre-Cure 5, the franchise shifted from its signature duo format to a multi-girl team. While no series since then has used the old two-person format from beginning to end, close friendship has still been a key theme in every iteration. And to give you just an idea of how much Precure there is, Toei has had new Precure episodes running virtually all year, every year, since 2004, making it easily the longest Magical Girl franchise ever, with over 700 episodes across all series as of this recording. There has also been at least one movie for each individual series, so add 14 of those to the mix, and there's usually an All-Stars crossover movie every year, which adds 12 more movies for a total of 26 theatrical Pretty Cure motion pictures, with the recent Hugto Pretty Cure Futariwa Pretty Cure All-Stars Memories film featuring all 55 main cures created from 2004 to 2018, all of whom had speaking parts. Marvel Studios, eat your heart out. But I'm not here today to talk about the gargantuan thing Precure has become. Instead, let's go back to the salad days of 2004, before anyone knew the real shape of this whole endeavor. As far as audiences back then knew, this was just another Magical Girl series with maybe a little more punching and kicking than normal. Also more self-aware jokes. <laughs> Yes, back then, it was just Nagisa and Honoka against the forces of evil, with nothing but a pair of annoying cell phone fairies to guide them. Yeah, I know, just go with it. It's fascinating to look back at Futariwa Pretty Cure and compare it to modern incarnations of the franchise. While many broad tropes, and a few specific ones, have carried through from then to now, the use of just two main girls forced the show to make sure we really liked those girls and wanted to keep having adventures with them. Nagisa and Honoka's brains and brawn dynamic is a simple but powerful character combo that makes them continually interesting to watch. And fewer main characters to lean on means the supporting characters should be fun to hang out with as well. I always love seeing what series like this do with classmates and friends of the main characters. Part of being a magical girl with a secret identity is trying to hide that identity not only from adults, but from one's peers. School is not an easy place to be a superhero. You're under frequent supervision in a restricted environment, expected to be in certain places at certain times, and even in the rare moments when adults don't care where you are, your friends probably do. There's a reason that high school superheroes like Peter Parker and Miles Morales are so popular. Part of it is their relatability, but another part is just the thrill of seeing how they'll balance school and heroics without getting caught. This balance becomes especially precarious when a character's hero identity becomes famous and widely talked about. 
meaning there will be some nail-biting times when the hero needs to talk to their friends about their own alter ego without giving away the whole ball game. Or lacrosse game, as it were. Anyway, while I wouldn't call the classmate characters in Fatariwa Pretty Cure the most fleshed out, let's say, two of them at least have a unique place in the history of the franchise. Those characters are Natsuko Koshino and Kyoko Mori. We first see these characters in Futariwa Pretty Cure episode 13, when a monster of the week attacks the school science fair. Natsuko and Kyoko are asleep in the auditorium at the time of the attack and end up getting trapped inside. Unable to leave, they witness the giant monster attack, which is not normally a thing that happens in this show despite all logic to the contrary, and more importantly, they witness Pretty Cure, something no civilians have known about up to this point either. Natsuko and Kyoko can't make out the Cure's identities from where they are, but they see them make their signature pre-battle speech and see them fight the monster. In episode 14, Nagisa and Honoka hear rumors circulating about the mysterious heroine's Pretty Cure, and sure enough, Natsuko and Kyoko are the source of these rumors. They're clearly enamored by what they saw, and both already have some hot takes on who is best cure and who is worst. Things get even more distressing after school when the owner of Nagisa and Honoka's favorite takoyaki stand, Akane, says she knows about Pretty Cure as well, and even acts out some of their dramatic speech. This shouldn't be possible since Akane was nowhere near the science fair attack, or any other attack, when it happened. Things start falling into place, though, when Akane points the girls in the direction of a children's park where she says Pretty Cure performs. Nagisa and Honoka book it over to the park and... <laughs> Nagisa and Honoka get the fakes alone and ask them why they're doing this. Natsuko and Kyoko explain that after seeing Pretty Cure the week before, they were horsing around and talking about their new idols when a group of young children asked them what they were doing. They told the children about Pretty Cure and even claimed to be them. Okay. Despite their young age, the kids were dubious that something like that could be real. On impulse, Natsuko told the kids they could prove their story by letting them meet Pretty Cure, raising the kids' spirits. Two overnight cosplays later, and the duo were play-acting as Pretty Cure for their new fanbase the next day. Natsuko and Kyoko get not the reaction they were hoping for when Nagisa and Honoka tell them they should stop what they're doing. Because, I don't know, someone might hypothetically, theoretically be after the real Pretty Cure, which could maybe possibly put the fake cures in a lot of danger, you know, it's just a theory, you know. Of course, no stands worth their salt like having outsiders rain on their parade, so Natsuko and Kyoko tell the two off and leave. And wouldn't you know it, one of those totally hypothetical enemies of Pretty Cure just happens to find them. The mini-boss for this part of the series, a vampire-like woman named Poisony, is smart enough to realize two things. One, these two very obviously aren't the real Pretty Cure. And two, the real Pretty Cure probably would be interested in the pair's continued safety. So it's not long before Nagisa and Honoka spot their impersonators again, standing in a daze atop a tall building completely brainwashed. Poisony uses the fakes to not only fight against Pretty Cure, her brainwashing also grants the girls super strength, but also makes them nearly throw themselves off the rooftop at several points. This makes it extremely difficult for the cures to both defend themselves and keep the fake cures safe. Dang, sometimes this series really was not messing around when it came to child endangerment. The cures protest and tell Poisony to fight fair, which works about as well as you'd think. Poisony escalates things by turning some nearby construction equipment into monsters, and the cures end up grabbing the fakes and dragging them away, which helps break the mind control somewhat. The monsters attack, and the cures block with a rainbow shield, which mysteriously does not appear in the series much after this. This is an artifact of the creators not having solidified the cure's abilities this early on. Then the fakes start coming too, and they see Pretty Cure defending them before they pass out. The battle then resolves the same way most of these battles do, with the cure's patented big honkin' laser beam with somewhat questionable name. Pretty Cure!
after the fight, Natsuko and Kyoko come to and admit they probably should stop dressing up as Pretty Cure. I mean, the danger of that is clear by now. They do ask if Nagisa and Honoka know where Pretty Cure went, but the two of them play dumb as they leave the construction site. All seems resolved for now, except... Cut to the next day and Natsuko and Kyoko are back at it again like nothing happened. Our heroes aren't thrilled, but considering the bad guys don't ever seem to try the same plans twice, they're just glad the girls are safe again. Now if only they could get that darn speech right. So this is a pretty standard episode of Precure, and Natsuko and Kyoko seem like standard, if flashy, filler characters. I haven't seen past episode 14 yet, but from what I've researched, their appearances after this are all minor and just involve them making costumes for people when needed. Barely anyone ever talks about them, aside from the Pretty Cure wiki and summaries of their one big episode, and they didn't have any appreciable impact on the larger story of Futariwa Pretty Cure or the overall Pretty Cure franchise. So why talk about them in their episode? Well, these girls highlight something we haven't seen much in the franchise since this original series. In-universe Precure fandom. Only a handful of other Precure series really deal with the idea of the cures being known by the public, and even fewer with people being fans of them. Yes, Precure 5 dealt a little bit with the cures getting media attention by way of a student newspaper reporter. There is evidence of the Cures having in-universe fans in both Fresh Precure and Heartcatch Precure, particularly with the character of Kenji Ban in Heartcatch, who at one point imagined a Cure Sona for himself called Cure Fire. And Precure does seem like a worldwide phenomena in Happiness Charge Precure, at least. Beyond those, though, as far as I can tell, the franchise doesn't focus much on what the public thinks of Precure. And in many series, like the currently airing Star Twinkle Precure, the public doesn't even seem to know such a thing exists. And unless you count Cure Gorilla from Smile Precure, Natsuko and Kyoko, I believe, are still the only characters who have pretended to be Pretty Cure. The impact of people knowing about the Cures doesn't usually seem that big from what I can tell. People like Akane and the other schoolgirls are surprisingly blasé about the existence of magical transforming superheroines. I can't say for sure what the rest of the show is like on this front, but based on my cursory research, the existence of these frilly warriors seems to merit about the same level of excitement as the latest episode of a mildly popular TV show. So it's at least nice to see a taste of some bigger impact through Natsuko and Kyoko. Apart from providing a fun concept for their one episode, them expressing their fandom the way they do also gives the writers a chance to comment on Precure fandom in general. In the flashback, the kids who approach them at first are mostly girls, but there's also one boy, and all of them are excited by the idea of meeting Pretty Cure. This carries over to the larger group of kids they entertain, which also shows a mix of genders. This seems to be the creative team acknowledging that while Pre Cure is aimed at young girls, anyone who likes their heroic spirit and flashy, floofy outfits can be a fan, regardless of gender. We can see echoes of this spirit carried all the way through to recent series like Hugto Precure, where the main character's motto is you can do anything. You can be anything. Moreover, that show explicitly shows that a boy, or a non-binary person depending on how you interpret Henri's gender, can wear dresses and become a pretty cure themselves if they want to. The team of Nagisa and Honoka themselves reflects this attitude towards gender and precure, with Nagisa being a tomboyish jock and Honoka being a brainiac science whiz. Both fall outside traditional feminine archetypes, and neither are types that people would expect to work together at that. Yet, they both get to be part of this iconic, super-feminine power duo. You can do anything. You can be anything. And if that's an ultra-roughly superhero who sends the bad guys back to the abyss where they belong, more power to you, regardless of who you are. <clears throat> of course, it also helps if you buy our toys and merchandise, says Toei. Speaking of merchandise, I should point out that Natsuko and Kyoko do actually have a bit of merch, which made me happy to find out. One of my good friends in the Precure fandom, Pike, pointed out this Natsuko and Kyoko button that came out for Precure's 15th anniversary this past year. 
They also have their own card in the Japanese card game Prism Connect, and they appear on one other card. Also, I'm not sure what this was for exactly, but this 15th anniversary promo art features them in Tariwa Pretty Cure's section of the Precure timeline. And outside of strictly merchandise, there was at least one instance of them getting their own Kigurumi suits for a 2010 Precure live show. Pretty much all of this stuff comes from well after the original run of the show, which tells me that while these girls didn't have a huge impact on the story, people still remember their episode fondly. Another part of their appeal may be the fact that Toei didn't just hire any old seiyu for their roles. Natsuko is voiced by Ami Koshimizu, who is also voiced Tenma in School Rumble, Ryuko in Kill a Kill, and Colin in Code Geass. Plus, she would go on to voice a bona fide cure in her own right with Hibiki slash Cure Melody in Sweet Precure. Kyoko's Seiyu is the slightly less well-known but no less talented Kaori Nazuka, who's voiced Miu in the Prisma Ilya series, Mount Lady in My Hero Academia, and hey, another Code Geass connection, she's Nunnally. And if you like these seiyu, they actually got to record a duet together as Natsuko and Kyoko on the second Futariwa vocal album. The song is called It's So Cool, Iketeru Heart. It's a simple song, but it fits their characters, being about pushing on with their dreams despite obstacles in their way. One of the verses goes into how they started out as copies of someone else, but seeing how they inspired other people spurred them on to greater things. It makes me smile to know that these, these tiny bit characters with big hearts just got this really nice sum up of their story in song format. Aww. Okay, cool. I think that wraps up this video then. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this episode deep dive as much as I did. This video was commissioned through my Patreon, and while the patron requested to remain anonymous, I'm super grateful for their idea. I had a ton of fun finally getting to dig into the original Futariwa Precure like this. I ended up watching not only the patron's requested episode, but most of the episodes leading up to it as well. I was just enjoying myself so much, I couldn't stop watching. It just goes to show the appeal of the show all these years later, and how much of a worthy platform it was for launching the phenomena that is Precure today. Anyway, if you would like to commission a video like this, check out my Patreon for more information. The way it works is you pledge and pay the commission account you want for one month, and then afterwards you can either drop down to a smaller monthly pledge or delete your pledge entirely. You send me a Patreon message with your request according to whatever tier you picked, and then we sort out the details from there. But yes, this was a lot of fun. I hope I can do more mini-sodes like this again in the future, both patron-sponsored and not. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you all again soon. Thanks so much again to all my patrons who support me every month, especially Author X, Julia and Kyle, Lavitz, Otaku no Podcast, Outcats Meow, PK, and Stone Umbrella. And as always, Rally Vincent deserved better, and the best transformation phrase is still Takumakumayakon, Takumakumayakon! Goki Gang Yo, mother -fuckers. Watch the Gear. I wouldn't be doing this if not for the generous support of viewers like you. You can support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Aaron Cerise. You can make small one-time donations at ko-fi.com slash Aaron Cerise. Or you can always share this video and leave a like or comment to show your support. Thanks so much again, and have a good day! Goodbye!